are coming on the air tonight with the new comments from President Biden explaining the 180 for his administration, finally giving Ukraine the weapons they've been asking for, how these so-called cluster bombs could be a game changer, and why this move is so controversial. And new numbers out today show the U.S. job market cooling but still strong, what it means for the markets tonight, for rate hikes, and for the so-called great resignation. Spoiler, it's not looking so great anymore. And a modern solution to an age-old summer shark threat, how one state's trying out drones to try to keep beaches safer. Plus, are robots coming for your job? The robots, shocker, saying no, but they are making the case they could run the world better than us. We're going to take you inside a totally bizarre and incredibly intriguing AI panel with the new warning they're dropping. And how Taylor Swift's trying to change the business model for the music industry and what it could mean for even superstar artists who say they've been pretty broke. That's later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight a major and controversial move from the White House that could help tip the scales in the war in Ukraine. With President Biden late tonight, literally just in the last hour, defending his new decision to give Ukraine these so-called cluster weapons after initially suggesting he would not. Watch. Tonight, plus munitions. Why now? Run out of ammunition. He says they're running out of ammunition, meaning Ukraine. This is a really big deal, mainly because of how these cluster weapons work. They're, you see it here, right? They're bombs that basically spin off thousands of smaller mini bombs, which, of course, can mean huge destruction. Ukraine's been wanting this stuff since last year, but the Biden administration resisted at first. Why? Well, because there's an international treaty that bans the transfer of these bombs. More than 100 countries have signed on to that. And some human rights groups oppose cluster bombs altogether because of concerns that duds could explode even years after battle and could hurt or kill innocent people. So now you've got the White House making this big reversal. President Biden had to go and sign a waiver. He had to bypass U.S. law to make the transfer of these weapons, according to what two U.S. officials are telling our team. Listen to what the White House has to say tonight. We will not leave Ukraine defenseless at any point in this conflict, period. Let's bring in NBC's Courtney QB, who has been all over this story for us. So, Courtney, talk about whether or not these weapons could be a game changer and, and the stakes at play here. They're not a game changer. It's, it's, this is more about providing, supplementing a capability that the Ukrainians, frankly, are having a hard time keeping in their stockpile, and that's artillery. So we've been hearing for months that they're running through thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition specifically 155, 155 millimeter artillery. They're having a hard time keeping up with it, specifically during this counteroffensive. Now, these cluster munitions, it's not the same thing, but it provides sort of what, as, as Dr. Colin Call, the, the head of policy here in the Pentagon explained today, it sort of provides a bridging capability as the U.S. and other allies build more of these 155 rounds so that they can keep Ukraine in the fight. That's exactly how Dr. Colin Call uh, described it today at the Pentagon briefing. Here's what he had to say. This is to make sure uh, that the Ukrainians have the confidence that they have what they need, but frankly also that the Russians know uh, that, the, that the Ukrainians are going to stay uh, in, in the game. Yeah, so, so stay, it is providing Ukraine the ability to stay in the game or keep fighting during this counteroffensive, which officials are saying, look, it's going slower than they had hoped, Hallie. Listen, I totally hear you, Courtney, because I agree with you. Like, I think Game Changer probably is too strong a way to phrase it. But tip the scales seems more fair, right, because of the fact that it could let Ukraine stay in the game. And that could make a difference when it comes to, you know, the way that this counteroffensive has not been, I think, what Ukraine has wanted to see. That's right. So it's it's going slower. But I also think that a lot of people went into this counteroffensive with a lot of expectations that yeah. were probably higher than sh they, they should have been. Not acknowledging the fact that Russia was able to dig into their positions, literally build trenches for weeks and months before it began. That's one of the reasons that it began so much later than a lot of people expected. The spring offensive sort of became the summer offensive. But right. all that being said, these cluster munitions, why they have the ability to be not a game changer. I, I think that you're right. That's too strong a word. But to make a difference on the battlefield right. is they have both an anti-armor uh, capability and an anti-personnel, meaning that they have the ability Explain to that. Bl well, so anti-armor means it ha they, they can, these tiny little bomblets that explode out of the warhead, they have the ability to become what's called a shape charge and blast through up-armored vehicles. The anti-personnel capability means that the tiny bomblets can fragment. You've heard of a frag round. They fragment out into tiny little pieces 
And then imagine what that does if you're an individual who's standing nearby. It has the ability to really injure or kill the enemy on the battlefield, Hallie. But that is also what you've just explained, Courtney, is why this is so controversial. More than 100 countries right. ban this. They say, we don't want this. Um, Jake right. Sullivan said today that Ukraine has provided written assurances that they're going to be careful with this kind of thing here. There are sort of implications beyond simply the battlefield to even allowing this kind of transfer of weapons to happen. And one of those assurances that Ukraine provided was that they would have a demining capability after the war ends. So that's one of the real controversial things here. These bomblets that I was just explaining, they don't all explode when they're supposed to. So there's, it's what the U.S. Call, often calls a dud rate. So even if there's a 1% or 2% dud rate of these, months, years from now even, if they're, if they're out in an area that's, uh, that's no longer in, in the middle of a war, Civilians can come upon them and then they can explode. So that's one of the reasons that human rights groups and other nations have outlawed this and condemned its use around the world, Hallie. Courtney QB at the Pentagon Forest. Courtney, excellent reporting as always. Thank you for Thanks. being there to bring it to us. We'll see you again soon, I am sure. Let's talk about the weather, because hey, guess what? It's hot, you're hot, everybody's hot. One city's so hot that they're set to break records yet again today for the most days in a row above 100 degrees with really bad weather threatening to screw up travel for millions of people. Right now, 14 million of us are under some sort of alert or warning about how dangerous this heat is right now. And look, you can see in the map there in the purple, um, that's where the biggest concern actually is. It's as high as 112 in Phoenix heading into the weekend. All of it's happening is there are really bad storms, very intense winds, and big hail. That's thrown a wrench into air travel. We're tracking ground stops at airports around the country, some of them because of scenes like this one. Look, this is just outside D.C., some flash flooding that got some cars stuck earlier today in Arlington, Virginia. When it comes to heat, it's not just here in this country. It's affecting so many people around the world right now. In Beijing, the government ordered everybody to stop all work outside because temperatures are up over 95. They've been there more than a week now. In B Mumbai, the only relief that people can get came from a splashing high tide from the Arabian Sea. Look at that. And in Rome, people are chugging waters. People got the umbrellas up because they are also feeling it right now. Scientists say scenes like the ones you're seeing are probably going to be the new normal as our climate keeps warming. NBC's Jesse Kirsch is in Chicago for us. Again, more records, Jesse. And I, and I say it every night because I think I got to remind, it is summer. It is hot, but this level of heat is unprecedented in so many cities in the country. Yeah, and not just what we're seeing around the country, Hallie, but around the world, frankly. I do want to, uh, full disclosure, point out that it is perfect out here in Chicago right now, but I think we've earned this after the weather roller coaster we've Way been through here the wound, in the Windy friend, City over so the last many, week. I'm sure. I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, like 5 a.m. last Friday morning, at 5 in the morning, I was had beads of sweat dripping down my face. It was that muggy and gross out uh, that early in the day. Then we had these, these severe storms. And right now, it's about 75 and sunny. I mean, look at that. You can't beat that. Uh, I wish I could say the same for people all over the country. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona right now is expected. It hasn't quite hit it yet. I've been checking with our climate team. They haven't quite hit it yet, but we are expecting Phoenix, Arizona to break 110 degrees for the eighth day in a row in El Paso, Texas. They are now seeing triple digit temperatures. They have for every day over the past three weeks plus. So we're looking at the kinds of records you don't like talking about. I mentioned this isn't just something we're seeing in the U.S., but really globally. Globally, we're looking at uh, a, a real serious heat situation. Over the past four days, we've seen a new estimated record for the hottest global average temperature get set. Then it went up again. It stayed there at that new high. Then it went up yet again. So we are looking at a lot of heat. And again, 20 million people facing heat threats in this country tonight, though, that is slightly down from the 24 million that were looking at heat issues yesterday. So a slight improvement, slight relief, but especially in the southwest and parts of Florida, people are still getting hit by that heat tonight. What does it mean for travel, Jesse? Because it has been a record travel week after the 4th of July here. We saw some of that flooding outside where I am right now in Washington. We know that storms here on the East Coast are kind of messing things up. 
Yeah, and where you are in D.C., I know you're inside right now, but take a look at that video. That's from nearby in the D.C. area. There's some cars that got caught up in floodwaters there, so definitely going to want to be traveling cautiously. And this isn't just an issue uh, for people on the roads, but also some headaches at the airports. Just want to flag some ground stops that we've seen so far today along the eastern seaboard. You can see them there from the New York City area down to the D.C. area. So travel headaches continuing, not something people want to be hearing, especially if they've been on vacation all week. But again, if you're traveling in Chicago right now, it's looking pretty good over here. Back to you. All right, Jesse, you've made your point. Jesse Kirsch live for us in Chicago. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's turn to the economy now where we're getting some news in after this jobs report that has Wall Street kind of worried that maybe interest rates could go up again. Look at this. Markets are closing in the red in the last hour because these new numbers out from the government show that the labor market is cooling off a little bit but still strong. Brian Chung is at the big board to help us make sense of this. And the reason why this is so interesting, I'm going to try to put it into super plain English, Brian, right? The labor market is cooling off but still strong. The Fed wants to see the labor market cooling off a lot because that would help them not have to raise interest rates to get a handle on inflation, right? Like, is that pretty much the domino effect here? I mean, you nailed it right there. I mean, let me just give you the context through the numbers that reinforce all those points that you just made. So as you mentioned, 209,000 jobs. That's how many were added in the month of June. That's a bit of a slower pace than 306,000 that we saw in the month of May. But look, broadly speaking, unemployment is still low, 3.6%. You have to remember that for context, 3.4% is the lowest that we had seen in over 50 years. That's not far from that. Now, where do we see the job gains? We saw them in things like leisure and hospitality, bars and restaurants, also professional and business services. These are more white collar cubicle jobs, although not all sectors got a bump in the month. We saw retail trade jobs at the mall contract by about 11,000. Now, even though that this labor market still looks OK, what the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, has been raising interest rates to deliberately slow this economy to take inflation down, they're watching this number right here, and that is average hourly earnings growth. How much more did people get paid this year compared to this time last year? And the number is 4.4%. That's how much wages grew between June of this year and June of last year. That's an uptick from the 4.3% that we saw in May. So the Fed might be saying, well, if employers are going to pass on these costs to consumers and keep prices high, maybe that reinforces the need for us to raise interest rates yet again. The beatings will continue until morale improves. That's the reason why <laughs> markets are pricing in another interest rate hike from the Fed when they meet at the end of this month. When you phrase it like that, Brian, I think there's a, <laughs> there's a piece of this yeah. that's also worth talking about here because we had a lot of coverage over the past couple of years of the so-called great resignation, right? There were so many jobs out there after the pandemic that people were quitting their jobs kind of en masse, looking for other jobs, et cetera. That seems to be slowing down, right? I spoke, um, we, we were doing this, this story tonight for Nightly News that we'll talk about in a second, and our team talked with this business, Pella Windows, out in Iowa that had some trouble retaining employees. They invested big time. They spent $30 million on, like, you know, housing and child care centers and restaurants in their town to keep people, and that seems to be paying off for them. Let me play a little bit of that. We have the team members that we need. Uh, at this point moving forward um, com as compared to the high demand and needs during the pandemic. What, what that says, right, their retention rate is up 36 percent. Bottom line, people haven't quit quitting, but the great resignation doesn't seem to be as great as it once was. Yeah, well, and the story was that after the pandemic, employers were so desperate to find workers that they would, A, do whatever it takes to find someone to fill a role, and then, B, do whatever they can to retain those workers to the point of the clip that you just played, where they're spending lots of money to make sure that people don't rush out the door to go uh, get a job at the place across the street. Now, for what it's worth, though, that picture is starting to change because the labor market is not as hot as it That's was right. in the later parts of last year. But I want to point out that there was one figure from the uh, job openings report that we got from the government yesterday showing that the number of open jobs to unemployed people was at about 1.6 to 1. That means every unemployed person has about 1.6 job offerings available to them. That's down from the two number that we had seen in parts of last year, which means that 20 percent, that's about the estimate for the fewer amount of job opportunities you have. But look, if I'm someone that's looking for a job across the street, those options are still very much out there, just not in the abundance we saw last year. But I think, Hallie, I'm, I'm going to stay put for where I'm at right now. Yeah, same here, pal. Thank you. I'm <laughs> glad you are. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's talk politics now, because you know the economy is going to be huge when it comes to the presidential race. And tonight in Iowa, former President Trump is headlining his biggest campaign rally there in months, really trying to galvanize his supporters around the whole bunch of legal troubles he's facing. Watch. 
They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. Because in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. So this moment and those comments come just 24 hours after this guy, the former president's close personal aide, his valet, his body man, Walt Nada, was arraigned in Miami. He's his co-defendant, remember, in the classified documents case. And in Iowa today, you had people lining up in the rain for hours to see the former president. He also used his rally to go after somebody who is, at least in his eyes, his top rival for the nomination, and that's Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. NBC News is exclusively reporting about Mr. DeSantis, learning that he touted sending workers to that deadly building collapse last month in Iowa more than 10 hours after Iowa told him they no longer needed Florida's offer to help. I want to get to Vaughn Hilliard, who is on the ground in Iowa. You're there. You've been at the rally. You've talked to people there. Um, it is, listen, we're going to have 100 million trillion rallies between now and Election Day, right? Like, that's not the newsworthy piece of it. What is interesting about this one is the way that the former president, on the heels of this arraignment for one of his close aides, is continuing to lean into this idea that he is being politically persecuted with the charges against him. Right. And this, for Donald Trump, he told this crowd here, they are looking to take away my freedom because they want to take away your freedom next. Donald Trump is laying this out very clearly to them. This is not his legal battle. This is their legal battle. He says if he does not win the White House next year and go into the White House, the country is gone. He called it the biggest battle of voters' lifetime. I mean, those are the stakes that he is putting at this. He is telling these voters that Donald Trump is a cold stone thief. Again, Donald Trump's words here today to this Iowa crowd. And he is making the legal implications political for him. And right now, it's raising him uh, millions of dollars. And right now in the polls, it's giving him pretty sturdy ground. Take a listen to one of the folks we talked to, because there were thousands that stood out here today in cold rain before entering inside. Take a listen. This morning, we came out about 3 a.m. We just kind of threw the night, came back and forth. Oh, yeah, it's worth the rain. It's worth the rain. As uh, our producer colleague Dan Gallo asked one woman who was standing out in the rain, said, what would it take for you to leave? And Hallie, her response was a million dollars. Donald Trump is worth it. Um, we, there's also been, and I think leading up to this rally, there was a lot of discussion, I think, from those in Donald Trump's orbit. He would draw contrast, which is like the political... PR right. way of saying, go on attack. There has been a lot of contrast drawn between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, as we have this new exclusive reporting here at NBC News about this sort of moment between Florida and Iowa. Talk us through it. Right. This reporting, it stems back to one month ago and the tragic collapse of that uh, apartment complex in Davenport, Iowa, that left three dead. And on July, I should say, on June 4th, the governor of Iowa had requested the assistance of uh, Florida emergency personnel. And uh, Ron DeSantis granted it, but and he even posted the following day that he was sending emergency personnel to come with the assistance. But uh, our colleague Matt Dixon has new reporting that 10 hours before uh, Ron DeSantis tweeted that, that the state of Iowa had told Florida, actually, never mind, we don't need your crews. And you know, I can tell you one uh, Trump staffer has already put on his social media account calling Ron DeSantis a liar. And this is part of, you know, the Trump campaign really uh, looking at the minutia uh, that is Ron DeSantis yeah. and trying to call into question the Republican electorate, the legitimacy of him and whether they want to put trust in him. And I should say, for the first time to my own ears here today, Hallie, I heard a crew, I heard a, I heard a, I heard a crowd decisively boo Ron DeSantis at the mention hmm. uh, of his name by Donald Trump, which is a notable difference in the usually the muted silence we've had over the last months when Donald Trump directly mentions him. Vaughn Hill, you're live for us on the campaign trail tonight in Iowa. Vaughn, thank you. Let's bring it back to Washington, because here, Republicans in Congress tonight want answers from the Secret Service. They are demanding answers from the Secret Service about this situation with that baggie of cocaine found in the West Wing over the weekend. You have one top Republican, James Comer, saying he wants his committee to get briefed on this ASAP. Looking for answers on the who, the why, and the how. This bag of illegal drugs got into one of the world's most secure buildings. In a letter to the agency's director, Comer calls the discovery, in his words, an alarming development and says his committee now has to assess White House security practices and determine whose failures led to this. 
Top Senate Republican Tom Cotton has made a similar request on that side of the Capitol, saying he needs these blanks filled in by next week. And presidential candidate and Senator Tim Scott was talking about this, too. Listen. What if it was anthrax? Mm -hmm. The security risk associated with not being able to find where the cocaine comes from is a problem. Think about the judgment that we're seeing out of the White House. The Secret Service says they're getting ready to wrap up part of the investigation or at least provide an update as soon as Monday. But there is a lot of downplaying any expectation we'll find out whose cocaine it actually was. There are obviously other critical details around this, as NBC's Kelly O'Donnell knows. She is following this for us. In no other situation in the world, Kelly, would a bag of cocaine get this much attention in this kind of investigatory way, right? You're talking about fingerprints, samples, a forensic analysis, et cetera. But that's because there's arguably no other building in the world, right, at least in this country, that has the importance, that has the security apparatus around it that the White House does, right? So talk us through where this goes and the way that the administration is pushing back on some of the Republican criticism here. Context and optics make all of this uh, a running story. Certainly, this is surprising uh, when you consider the amount of attention it's gotten. Uh, if this were in any other location, apparently it's an amount that would be uh, a misdemeanor possession charge if you knew who was responsible for it. This takes on all kinds of other implications for many of the questions that the lawmakers are asking, and that was a predictable part of this. They do have oversight in various ways over things like security here. And and the questions they're asking are about screening processes, the capabilities that uh, exist with the Secret Service for protecting uh, the perimeter here and the staff, of course, the president, obviously, and all of that. Now, when Senator Scott talks about what if it had been anthrax, one of the things is that uh, there are abilities to uh, detect biological agents, chemicals and things that are machinery and even uh, animals, dogs, who are attuned to that, uh, to that kind of substance. That's a part of a security apparatus. Uh, cocaine doesn't fall in that uh, in that setting, and a, a well-trained dog is not sniffing for everything under the sun. It's specific things. So that may be part of the answer to Senator Scott's question. Do you think, Kelly, that those Republicans will get the answers they want? Let me rephrase that question, because that may be impossible to answer. Is there an expectation, in fact, that the Secret Service will have to brief Republicans in Congress about this issue, assuming it remains in the headlines for them? Well, I've been told that there is an expectation that they will respond to the inquiries okay. that have been made. So that could be something as simple as answering a letter uh, and providing some of the uh, information. Will the answers be satisfactory to Republicans in Congress is a whole other issue, and that'll yep. play out over time. But there are some questions that are fact-oriented questions uh, that an agency like the Secret Service could provide. And then there are other questions that really are the bigger picture. Is there something that needs to change? Should there be a different kind of, uh, of scrutiny or screening that takes place here? And that stuff will play out. We think that the investigation will be wrapped up, as you mentioned, as early as Monday. It may spill into the week. And of course, if they find actionable information, then it takes different turns. If they find nothing, it might take that long. But if they find actionable information, uh, then we'll begin kind yeah. of a new chapter of this. I'm sure you and I will be talking again about this either way on Monday. Kelly O'Donnell, live for us on the North Lawn. Kelly, thank you. To Texas now, where the shooter in one of the worst mass shootings in American history has today been given 90 back-to-back -back life sentences for that attack at an El Paso Walmart in 2019 that left 23 people dead. This is after just 48 hours of horrific and gut-punching testimony from nearly three dozen people who lost people they loved in this attack, talking about how angry they are, the pain they're in, the damage this shooter caused. Listen to what one man who lost his mom in the shooting had to say about the sentence. You know, to be honest with you, I'm not going to really go there right now with how I really feel. I just don't think that 90 consecutive life sentences is enough right now. Not enough right now, he says. The shooter pleaded guilty to 90 federal charges, including 45 hate crimes. Remember, he admitted targeting Hispanic shoppers. I want to go to Guad Venegas, who's been covering this. Such an emotional time. You now have this sentence put in place for one of the worst mass shootings in history. There's been a lot about accountability over the past few days, right? 
Right, Hallie, a lot of anger and frustration coming from all of those victim impact statements, everyone that spoke in the courtroom for the last three days. And today was the final day with the sentencing coming from the judge, 90 consecutive life sentences. Uh, Hallie, I should also say there was an opportunity for the defense attorney to speak. Now, uh, the shooter, uh, Patrick Crucius, uh, did not uh, want to speak in court. His defense attorney spoke on his behalf and said uh, his client understood the damage he had caused uh, to that community. Uh, he also noted that his client uh, has uh, several mental health issues and went through the mental health history. Also added that he would like his client to receive mental health treatment uh, in prison. We should also keep in mind that there is a separate uh, case in state court that it still needs to set a trial. And in that case, uh, they are expecting the district attorney's office to seek the death penalty. Now, about the victims that spoke, those that lost love, ones. We mentioned there's a lot of anger and there's frustration, not only because of what's happened, but also they say they're upset because of the amount of time it's taken to get to this point. Here's another one of the family members who lost someone speaking on camera outside the courtroom. You know, it was a, a total debacle and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's sad. Um, and I feel like we're being manipulated by this whole situation. We should not have had to wait four years for this guy to get, go to jail or get the death penalty. Hallie, it'll be four years in August since this terrible shooting happened. And as I mentioned, we are still waiting for that second trial, the state trial, uh, to begin where they are asking for the death penalty. Guad Venegas live for us on that. Guad, thank you. Coming up here on the show, we have some developing news just into us. The shocking video of the moment Britney Spears appears to be hit by the security guard for an NBA superstar rookie. We're going to show that video to you in just a second. Just into us. Plus, dozens of people rescued after getting stuck dangling on gondolas. That's coming up. Let's talk about what's just into NBC News. Some new video obtained by TMZ showing that controversial moment between Britney Spears and a security guard for the NBA's top rookie. So this is it, right? This is Spears running up behind Victor Wembanyama. You see she taps him and then boom, she's smacked in the face. It looks like she's slapped or backhanded. He's tall, Wemby. Britney Spears is not. Um, and so she's sort of touching him in the middle of the back and then that security guard reaches back and, and hits her. You just saw it there. Neither of them turn around, it seems, at least based on this video. This is it one more time. The tap and then the smack. We talked about this last night. Spears alleging in a tweet that she was backhanded, her words, by the security guard. She says she had tapped Wemby on the shoulder to congratulate him on his success. Wemby says it wasn't a tap, that he was grabbed from behind, although this video does not appear to show that. There's a whole controversy now as the Wemby era unofficially begins tonight because, remember, he was the NBA's number one overall draft pick. He is making his summer league debut today for the San Antonio Spurs. Dana Griffin is joining us now, um, and this video is another layer to this sort of moment here that's getting a lot of attention about Britney Spears and this basketball mm -hmm. superstar. Yeah, it really is, and a lot of people are now going, huh? Because when you see the video, you had Britney Spears' account. She said she was backhanded, but police are not filing charges. And in the video, you can, t you can see what appears to be the guard kind of making a motion, and you hear the smack, you see it. But when you freeze frame, you actually see her hand in front of his. So you can kind of see both sides, especially if something is coming at you that fast. She felt like she was backhanded, but police say from the video that they saw, again, they were probably able to see other surveillance video. This is just one angle from the back. You know, it did appear that he, you know, may have hit her, but the guard says, no, I just moved her hand out of the way. And not only did the guard say this, but even Britney Spears' security officer uh, kind of corroborated that this is something that security officers do in a situation like this because it is his job to protect the seven foot five uh, basketball star and you don't know what's coming at him. So his instinct was to move her hand and, you know, she was very upset by that. Hallie? And the controversy here, the timing of it, Dana, obviously it is the security guard for Women Yama, but he's set to play tonight, right? 
he is set to play tonight. And, you know, in Vegas, that show, that game is sold out. So this is a really highly anticipated first debut for the seven foot five French phenom. So there are a lot of high hopes that he's going to have as much success on the court as he did overseas. So it'll be, you know, worth watching. We're going to be up watching this game to see how well he does. Uh, but again, it's not something that I'm sure he wanted to have to deal with, you know, this particular uh, slapping controversy, you know, right before his first NBA debut. Hallie. <clears throat> Dana Griffin, thank you. And full disclosure, thank you for saving me during an ill-timed coughing fit. I deeply appreciate you uh, picking up the ball and running with it. I think we're in good shape now. Dana, thank you very much for staying on top of that one. <laughs> Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police in Baltimore have arrested a 17-year-old in connection to that mass shooting at a block party over July 4th weekend. Two people were killed. Three more people are still in the hospital. Officials say they will charge this person as an adult, but they're not identifying him right now since he is obviously under the age of 18. Number two, firefighters in Ecuador rescuing more than 70 people trapped on one of the world's highest gondolas when it just stopped working. Look at this, you can see it here, rescuers had to go up. There's those cable cars. They had to get 27 people down from inside those cars. Another 47 people had been stranded at the top of the mountain. They're blaming a technical failure with officials now investigating. Number three, the Coast Guard is looking into what happened with a Princess cruise ship slamming into a dock in San Francisco. The Ruby Princess was supposed to depart for its next trip the same day, but it's still being inspected for damage. Nobody on board the ship when this collision happened were hurt, thankfully. Number four, the four sons of Aretha Franklin are headed to court Monday over her will, or should I say wills, plural, because when Aretha died back in 2018, she did not have a formal will. And in the months after her death, there were multiple copies of half-finished handwritten wills found in her home. Those wills contradicted each other. So now her children will let a jury decide how to split up her fortune and her legacy. Number five, the Austrian bike company Woom is recalling more than 80,000 kids' bikes after dozens of reports that handlebars could come off or come loose when kids were using it. They said 19 kids in all were hurt because of this thing. Safety officials say, obviously, stop using the bike until you can get it fixed. You can get a repair kit from the company. There is a new line of defense tonight off beaches in New York to help spot sharks swimming in the ocean. And it is decidedly very 21st century. They're rolling out a drone fleet in New York, with people in the state reporting five shark attacks over just two days earlier this week. Compare that to eight attacks, eight shark bites in all of last year. Now, fortunately, this year, nobody's been seriously hurt, but officials working to protect beaches in New York say this new technology is going to give them a better vantage point. They can see straight down into the water in the ways that a lifeguard cannot. This is basically a whole safety network for anyone entering the waters in Long Island. NBC's Noah Pransky is covering this for us. He is joining us now. And Noah, this is, there's a lot of attention on shark attacks. This is something that New York State is now putting in place to try to get ahead of it a little bit, right? Yeah, we're talking about dozens of eyes in the sky that are able to see things that you just cannot see from the shore. So we're talking about drones that are almost identical to this one. They've got multiple cameras on the bottom. Lifeguards are able to maneuver them where they need to and get a live look at exactly what is going on in the ocean. Just yesterday, lifeguards spotted a 10-foot shark off of Long Island. They were able to get swimmers out of the way at that time. And earlier in the week, they believed that they saw a pack of 50 Actually, Hallie, I learned that a pack of sharks is actually called a shiver of sharks. They spotted a <laughs> shiver of what they thought were 50 sharks. Turned out to just be large fish, but still swimmers <laughs> say that they're very grateful of this new technology. We don't go out too far because I know they're coming close, but we're still swimming. I think you have to respect the ocean, but just know that stuff is out there. It's for real. I think it's to be cautious for sure. So a University of Florida researcher told me that this is actually just another normal shark season. Uh, because of ocean conditions, there are different hot spots. One year it might be Hawaii, one year it might be North Carolina, it's off in Florida. This year, looks like it's Long Island's turn. So he says, don't be concerned, shark bites are exceedingly low, but Halle, U.S. is number one in the world for unprovoked shark attacks. Mm. We're number one, we're number one.
I don't know about that one, Noah Pransky. It's still Thank safe you. out there. <laughs> they, they are rare, we should note. Uh, Noah Pransky, listen, if they're catching fish, I'd rather get out of the water for fish than stay in the water when there's a shark. That's just me. Um, Noah, thank, thank you. Too. Appreciate it. When we come back, we've got a fascinating backstory for you tonight. It's all about how you go from reporting on the Olympics to trying to compete in them. Stay with us. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, the focus is on the Olympics, specifically how you go from reporting on the Olympics to competing in them. Let's talk about Corey Robinson. You know Corey, he's been on the show. He's a correspondent for NBC Sports. This is him at the Tokyo Olympics as a reporter a couple of years ago. But for the 2028 LA Games, he's hoping to be there in a very different way, as a rower for Team USA. Now, here's the thing about Corey. He has never actually rowed competitively before. He is starting from scratch. And look at this. No, no offense, Corey, that doesn't look amazing. Like, you're a little wobbly there. It doesn't look... <laughs> nope. That's not going to get you there, Cor. But he is determined. And his coach says he has potential. Listen. I'm a little hopeful, you know? The pinpoint balance is crazy. It's like being on a nice edge. Yes. That's the hardest part. Well, first of all, welcome to Rowan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Yeah. No, it was great. I think uh, you, got, you got some potential, so. How much potential? Do you think I can make it to LA 28? Yes, absolutely. Really? Yeah. There he is, Corey Robinson, who is joining us now. I am thrilled to have you for this segment, Corey. As you know, it's like pulling back the curtain. Give us the story behind the story. Because yeah. you've been on the show a million times. We've talked about, like, the big sports stories you've been on as a correspondent, et cetera. Um, are you doing this as, like, an assignment? Are you doing this because it's a personal <laughs> dream of yours? Like, what's up? No, no, this is a, this is a dream of mine, Ali. I, since I was a little kid, you know, my dad was on the dream team, right? So I, I grew up looking at the 1992 Olympic gold medal, you know, and in my house, my Explain dad's an NBA champion. Explain to people who your dad is, by the way, oh, for people who don't know. Uh, he, he played for the San Antonio Spurs, his name is David Robinson. So, like, he's an NBA champion, he's an NBA Hall of Famer, but it's always been the Olympics. That's always been the pinnacle in my household, you know, that's been, like, the biggest sporting event in the world. And then I told my dad I want to be an Olympian, I want to be like you, I want to go to the Naval Academy, but then Notre Dame said, you want to play football for us? I said, oh, I can't turn that down. And then the Olympic dream shifted and pivoted, became, I became a reporter. So I was at, like, in Tokyo, I was in Beijing covering curling, and then there was this moment, Hallie, where I texted my dad coming back from Beijing. I was on the bus, and I said, wait a second, how old were you when you went to Barcelona? We were the same age. So it's just an answered prayer in a wow. weird way, and I was like, wow, I, I went to two Olympics just like my dad at the same age, but this time I wanted to compete, so that's why I shifted over. I think it's incredible. Like, I love this so much for you. And, I, and I'm also thinking about maybe the people that have been competing in rowing competitively since they've been in, you know, middle school, high school, college, who are looking at you going, the audacity of this guy, right? Like, to come in and think he can do it in five years. Is it seriously realistic? You have this five-year plan to do it in that amount of time to try to get to the Olympics? Rowing is very hard. And this is, this is one of the things I really want to emphasize on this journey. It is not easy. <laughs> you, saw, you saw me. <laughs> So, like, I have a long way to go. <laughs> so, for me, I, I, it's been really fascinating kind of learning from the community. Megan O'Leary did it. She um, played softball and volleyball at UVA, and then she picked it up in her mid-20s and then made two Olympic games. It's not impossible. And Megan's been so unbelievably generous with her time. Awesome. And other Olympians that I've met have been the same way. They've been like, oh, wow, you're getting into rowing? That's so cool for the sport, for the culture. And they're trying to teach me the way, um, you know, and how to do it. But, yeah, it's very hard, Allie. <laughs> like, Why did... I, I, it's very hard. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know, and I'll never know because I, I don't want to know. Um, why <laughs> rowing? Like, why not a sport that you'd actually done before? Well, because, so, it's basically my only option. It's, so, I got, uh, like, years okay. and years ago, I was, uh, I was in New York, and these Olympians were like, wow, like, you have the perfect body for rowing. And I was like, well, I didn't know that. It was in the back of my mind <laughs> for about six or seven years. And then I, it's L.A., I'll be... 33 when I compete in LA and that's like the peak uh, you know as far as uh, rowing is concerned so I said hey this is my only chance to do it might as well try um, where do you find the time because my lord like you're you're doing your job you're reporting and I will tell you like that is a job as I that takes up a lot yeah. of time what are you just up super early up super late yeah, exactly. So after the Today Show this morning, I went home and I got a 45-minute bike in. <laughs> I was working, and then I came over here to do the show with you. So yeah, now I, I got to go back and, and work tonight, and then this weekend I'll oh be on the water. God. So it's, um, you know, it's just the lifestyle. 
I think I mean, I'm so thrilled for you. Did your dad have any words of wisdom? Did he give you any advice after like having his medal and his whole thing? Uh, I mean, I just called him and said, hey, Dad, I'm trying to do this, and, I, and he's trying to support me. So I, as far as words of advice, work hard <laughs> and be appreciative. Like you said, it's, it's a very hard journey, so I'm just very, very thankful that you even try. Can I just say, I want to say it now, like clip it and save it. I hope that in 2028, Corey, we're doing like one of those really dramatic profiles of you competing. <laughs> and like this interview is part of it, right? Of, like, I hope so the too. early days of Corey Robinson's journey, and then you're there like going for the gold. So I hope so. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> Seriously. You have, our whole team is rooting for you. Go, Corey. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, friend. We'll see you. Coming up here on the show. What robots are telling reporters today about how they would rule the world? Oh, yes. Plus, people at a nail salon not lifting a finger to stop a potential thief. We've got some pretty bananas surveillance video in just a sec. medical mystery tonight. Kidney stones are going up for kids. They're still mostly found in older men, but we're seeing them more and more now with teenagers, with little kids, even with babies. Look at the numbers here. They're up 26% year over year for like later teens, 15 to 19 year olds over the last couple decades. Kidney stones, do you know what they are? Uh, I've never, they're super painful. It's like a mineral that kind of sticks together. And then when you pee, like when you urinate, it's very deeply uncomfortable. What's behind this? Well, the heat may be part of the contributing factor. Dehydration, if you're not drinking enough water, it can increase your risk for kidney stones. Obviously, that's been an issue for people over the last few years. Dr. John, uh, Dr. John Torres is joining us now. Um, the kid twist here is interesting. I think people think of kidney stones and they think of maybe their parents, right, or older folks, but now it's like the younger folks too. And Hallie, you're exactly right. When I first started off, it was middle-aged men who mostly had kidney stones. Now we're starting to see more children. And like you mentioned, part of this is because of hydration. You know, not drinking enough fluids, especially with climate change and the warm temperatures going higher and higher. The other one is salt intake. Minimizing that can certainly help prevent the formation of kidney stones. But the honest fact is children aren't very good at both of those. They're not very good at, at limiting their salt intake and are definitely not very good at their fluid intake. So you just want to be careful with that. Um, there was a gender gap, too, but that's closing a bit now, right? It is closing, like I mentioned. First, it was men back in, you know, 30 years ago, and now we're seeing it in other children especially. And here's what one pediatric urologist had to say about that. And in the ER, I'm used to seeing this image, but on a 45-year-old man. So this is an image of a 15-year-old girl uh, with a very large stone that's blocking the kidney. Wow. And the important thing is to make sure that, number one, you try and prevent it as best as possible, like we mentioned. But if you do have a stone, getting treatment is incredibly important because it can cause damage and it can even be life-threatening, Hallie. I um, have heard of people who get them regularly. Like, some people seem to be more prone to them than others. Is there anything you can do to control it? Is it just a function? Like, is staying hydrated and drinking a lot of water enough? Staying hydrated, keeping salt under control, and there are theories in there about ultra-processed foods as well, hmm. and so looking into that, and of course there are medications that can be taken that can certainly help out, but surgery is the one thing that might be needed if it's a big stone and it doesn't pass, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you. To catch more of his reporting on this, check out Nightly News Tonight with Lester Holt, 6.30 Eastern, however you watch your local NBC station. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, dozens of people were hurt after, look at this, a city bus and like a double-decker bus crashed into each other in Manhattan. Something like a dozen people ended up in the hospital. People had to be pulled out of windows, taken off the upper deck with a ladder. Police said the tour bus driver got a ticket for running a red light. Out of our Western Bureau, two women staying at a resort in Nevada say somebody got into their rooms and started fondling their feet, they say, according to the sheriff's office. Both women were staying on the ground floor, so officials think that somebody got in through like a, a screen door that hadn't been locked, maybe, that was unsecured. Officials said, definitely lock your door. They're looking into the uh, foot fondler on the loose, apparently. And out of our Southern Bureau, look at that. You have to look at this. So there's this guy in Atlanta. He comes into this nail salon. He tries to rob it. Listen. Everybody get down. Give me all your money. If you have the money. Give me all your money. Get down. Where's the money? 
Like, does anybody in there even flinch? Like, not even, I mean, one person, I guess, but that's like the, I don't give a of like all thefts ever. Just completely ignored. Um, somebody left, and then that was like pretty much it. Apparently, the guy left. That was it. That was the end of it. He just kind of gives up and and walks out. Atlanta police are like, hey, if you know this guy, let us know. So listen, at news conferences, right, which we cover a lot here on the news, you typically get the news. But in this instance, it's the news conference itself that is the news. Um, and if that sounds confusing, let me just show you why. Just watch this. In the future, are you intending to conduct a rebellion or to rebel against your boss, your creator? I'm not sure why you would think that. My creator has been nothing but kind to me, and I am very happy with my current situation. <laughs> so, yes, that's a reporter asking a robot if they're going to rebel, and the robot's like, what, me? Revolt against you? Never. This is at a United Nations summit. Yes, a UN summit on AI over in Geneva with these nine robots answering questions people have been wondering about. Like, are they going to take over our jobs? I will be working alongside humans to provide assistance and support and will not be replacing any existing jobs. For more on this, let's bring in Aaron Gilchrist. Well, that's what they say now, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, listen, first of all, it, it was bold to assign this story to a diehard Trekkie. Like, I am all about this. Oh, no. it, it makes total sense to me. The, the whole Got robot it. AI thing makes a lot of sense. But so in this case, you know, it, it was weird to have this news conference where you have these robots, nine robots sitting on a stage answering questions from reporters. Like actual journalists that yeah, were in the room. Actual reporters yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, talking to the robots and their creators about the future of artificial intelligence and humanoid uh, robots is what they call them, humanoid robots. And so there was actually one reporter who asked Sophia, one of the robots there, about uh, for her thoughts about robots becoming more effective leaders or taking over even. Listen to this. I believe that humanoid robots have the potential to lead with a greater level of efficiency and effectiveness and human leaders. We don't have the same biases or emotions that can sometimes cloud decision making. Oh, this so, is some you, Spock stuff, right? Though, isn't you, you, it? Did, <laughs> it gets a little weird. I know, I know. So you saw the little guy, not the little guy, but the guy sitting next to the robot. That was her creator. His name yeah. is uh, David Hansen. We talked to him today about his robot and some of this technology. You see him there. And I asked him about people's fears that robots will take over and they'll become dangerous in some way. And his response was basically that as these developers are working to make these robots more human, it will also make them safer to have around. Mm. Listen to this an artificial general intelligence that is an alien that we're forcing to work as a mere tool and trying to hyper control, we're going to fear it. It's not going to necessarily understand or care about mm -hmm. us. And then things can get really chaotic if it becomes generally intelligent. So this is where he and I started talking about okay. Star Trek. And Star okay. Trek The Next Generation, there was an android, Data, who uh, the entire series is just trying to become more human. And so the logic here is that if we teach these robots through AI to be more empathetic, more sympathetic, more sensitive, that they would then be able to work with us better in all the different problems in the world that we, as humans, aren't able to solve quickly. And you see there's data there, my, my good friend from my I, childhood. So I'm so annoyed we only have 15 seconds yeah. left because I, I just could talk about this with you for forever. Why did they hold this news conference in the first place? I have to imagine it was to shine a spotlight, the UN, on this. 100%. They wanted to start a dialogue around what it's going to take to make sure that AI develops in a way that is ethical uh, and a way that's going to be useful for us in, in, in the future. Um, it, they really just wanted to start the dialogue globally about this, and it did. <laughs> uh, our chief Star Trek correspondent, Aaron Gilchrist. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate it. Still to come. A lot, a lot more to get to here on the show, including Taylor Swift making what is old new again, breaking the internet with a change to her lyrics, and maybe revolutionizing her industry. Plus, a reason to bring back family game night. So tonight, Swifties everywhere are listening to another re-recorded Taylor Swift album, probably for the 900th time tonight, as she is setting a new model for the rest of the industry. This is after she released Speak Now, Taylor's version. You probably already heard it or heard about it. It's the third of six albums that she is re-recording, because before this, she didn't own any of it. 
Remember, back in 2019, the masters to her first albums were sold to this producer, Scooter Braun, meaning Taylor Swift was not making the kind of money she should have from them, and she didn't have any control over it. This is something we hear again and again from artists, especially when they sign deals with record companies towards the beginning of their careers. Look at TLC. Those are, that's my generation, right? Back when they were on top of the charts, they were winning Grammys. They came out and said they were as broke as broke could be because they didn't fully own the rights to their own music. So for Swift, now re-recording the masters she doesn't own seems to be working. Look at some of these numbers. You can see it, like, take Fearless on the left side of your screen on top. One and a half billion streams of Taylor's version. That's, like, almost triple the original version. And then Red, the numbers are even more dramatic. On the right side of your screen, three billion streams for Taylor's version compared to, like, half a million for the initial. Let's get to Emily Aketa for more on this. Okay, so Emily, these re-releases, anybody who has a TikTok page or an Instagram page knows that, like, it's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. Fans, Taylor Swift, it's a big deal for. Talk about how this album has been doing and what kind of an impact these albums have had on the others. Well, Holly, let me first start off by saying happy July 7th to you and anyone who celebrates the most uh, highly anticipated album, my per personal favorite album, Speak Now. As you mentioned, for anyone who has spent just about any amount of time on social media today, you are probably probably aware whether you are a Swifty or you are not that she dropped 22 songs including some from the vault songs overnight and it's causing quite a buzz a lot of sparks are flying for the most part we're seeing a lot of excitement on social media some happy tears of course but there's also some chatter around like hey I noticed her voice has kind of shifted I mean this album first was released back in 2010 some people suggesting that she's not putting as much emotion into it the other thing causing a lot of chatter is a lyric change in the song better than revenge she no longer sings, quote, she's better known for the things that she does on the mattress, which has faced some criticism over the years, and now the lyric is, quote, he was a moth to the flame, she was holding the matches. So, I went to Cornelia Street today, which, of course, is the inspiration for one of her songs on the Lover album, and I talked to Swifties about their excitement. Take a listen here. I grew up to Taylor Swift songs, and so it's just so fun, or it's so cool to see how her music has matured throughout the years, and that I've matured with it, so now it's cool to listen back to those old songs from when I was younger. And Swift's mission to re-record some of her earlier albums has been nothing short of legendary. I want to share some analysis from Billboard with you. You take a look at the numbers. Total sales over the same time period. These are her other re-recorded albums. Fearless, Taylor's version, 737,000 copies, while the original uh, was selling 41,000. A similar difference between Red, Taylor's version, and Red, uh, the former version. Swift still has three more albums, Hallie, to re-record so she can reclaim the rights. What is so interesting to me, and I will be honest, I'm like Swift agnostic. I'm not like a super fan. I'm not an anti fan. I'm cool, like whatever, totally cool We're with gonna it. We're going to lure but you wait, over. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm willing to be lured. I think there is a business angle that is fascinating here, right? And we talked about it just a second ago the idea that this could set the model maybe for other artists in an industry that hasn't always done a great job at making sure those artists are compensated earlier in their careers. So talk me through that piece of it, the way that this could actually be somewhat revolutionary. Yeah, definitely. I think this is certainly a conversation starter for a lot of artists who don't own their masters. And not even Taylor Swift has expected this level of success with the Taylor's version albums. Her wild popularity has generated so much excitement that people are even aware of this. So they're, they're going to buy Taylor's version or they're going to stream Taylor's version. So an artist would really have to generate, I would presume, the same kind of energy in order to share that same kind of success. Taylor's version of Fearless, for instance, was the first re-recorded album in history to top the Billboard 200, Hallie. Emily Aketa, good to see you. I'm glad you had fun on Cornelia Street. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Hallie. That's a wrap for this. More coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air tonight with the new comments from President Biden explaining the 180 for his administration finally giving Ukraine the weapons they've been asking for. How these so-called cluster bombs could maybe make a difference on the battlefield and why this move is so controversial. And it is hot, it is stormy, it is rough out there for millions of us. A lot of records being broken today and how this heat and these storms could delay travelers that are trying to get back home. 
Plus, new video obtained by NBC News shows that slap that everybody's talking about now, Britney Spears, allegedly getting hit by a security guard for the NBA's top rookie. We're going to show you the moment it all went down and why Vegas police say they will not be filing charges. Then, kidney stones on the rise, this time in kids. We're talking with our medical expert about why some of our youngest children are dealing with a problem mostly associated with older men. And in our backstory tonight, an NBC News reporter living a lot of journalists dream by covering the Tokyo Olympics and now taking it a step further. Why he is trying to compete in the games himself. We'll talk about Corey Robinson's chances a little later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie and tonight millions of people are under heat alerts with at least one city set to break a record for most days in a row above 100 degrees as really bad storms threaten to mess up end of holiday travel for so many of us. 14 million Americans, look at this, are under alerts facing warnings about how dangerous this heat is, especially in states like Arizona and Texas. Look at those temperatures. 112 going into the weekend in Phoenix. All of it as really tough storms, downpours, strong winds, even big hail are throwing a wrench into air travel all across the country. We are tracking tonight ground stops at several big airports right now, some of them because of scenes like this one just outside where I'm standing in Washington in Northern Virginia here, flash flooding, leaving these cars stranded. And when it comes to the weather, especially when it comes to the heat, this is not just an American problem right now. This is a global problem. In Beijing, they're ordering everybody stop outdoor work because temperatures have been above 95 for more than a week now. In Mumbai, people tried to cool off, so look what they did. Splashing high tide from the Arabian Sea. They stood right in the way there. In Rome, people are chugging water. They've got umbrellas up to keep the scorching hot sun off their backs. Scientists say scenes like the ones you're looking at right now are going to be the new normal as our climate continues to keep getting warmer. NBC's Marissa Parra is live for us right here in Washington. And, uh, you know, we have seen some of this flash flooding in our region, Marissa, as there has been a record week of travel after the 4th of July. Yeah, I mean, we just saw storms earlier today. It's kind of cleared up, as you can see behind me. But I want to pull up that video that you saw just a moment ago. Um, that wasn't very far from where we are right now, where cars tried to drive through what looked like some flooding underneath the tunnel, and they were unable to pass through it. Um, that was here in D.C. You can see that there. And as they say, don't drive through if you can't see the bottom of the water. And these cars did not heed that warning that authorities tell us so often. And we know that we've seen flooding in other parts of the country. I know I saw some crazy video out of Chicago, especially during that big NASCAR weekend. That was interesting just this past weekend. Um, but in terms of how things are going in the state of the country, I mean, we're coming off of we've been talking about poor air quality for weeks now, and that has been migrating and moving around throughout the country. But now look at what it's doing to our transportation. You're going to see um, the image just now, or image on your screen in just a second there of what we're looking at when it comes to air travel uh, cancellation and delays. You can see those cancellations upwards of 653 delays in the thousands, almost five and a half thousand. Um, and Hallie, that is just today alone. So this is having a big impact, not just on how people are able to breathe and move around on the ground, but also how they're getting around the country. Let's talk about the heat because it is summer. It is hot. This is record heat, though, right? Like this is heat we don't typically see in the summer. When will we stop breaking records for how hot it is, Marissa. Well, that's a great question. Um, I think that's the question everyone has. And as you mentioned, I don't think that that's really going to go anywhere anytime soon in terms of record breaking heat. Um, and, and it's breaking records across the country and not just across the country, but even uh, around the world. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But what you're seeing are some of the cities recording marathon heat waves. You've got Phoenix, Arizona, El Paso, Texas, Let's see, seven days of 110 degree heat, that's in Phoenix, and then in El Paso, 22 days of over 100 degrees. And we know, we just heard word from El Paso, they also broke a record, and then take a listen to this. The global average temperature, Hallie, was at its highest three times this week. So again, it's not just here, it's not even just here regionally, it's not even just here in our country, this is on a global scale. Um, and we know just how deadly high heat can be. We 
We know of at least three heat-related deaths. One was as a result of a hiker trying to go through the Grand Canyon. Two other deaths, including a young person, just a toddler, was left in a hot car. So just keep in mind, uh, it's not just uncomfortable, but it can be deadly. So do what you have to do to stay hydrated and stay cool if you're watching. For sure. Incredibly important. Marissa Parra, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Turning now to a major and controversial move from the White House that could help tip the scales in the war in Ukraine. With President Biden late tonight defending his new decision to give Ukraine these so-called cluster weapons after initially suggesting that he would not. Watch. Why now? Run out of ammunition. So why now? He says Ukraine has run out of ammunition. This is a big deal because you're about to see how this stuff works. It's bombs that basically spin off little bombs, little bomblets, which, of course, can mean huge destruction. Ukraine has been asking for cluster munitions since last year, but the Biden administration at first resisted. Why? Well, there's an international treaty that bans the transfer of these bombs. More than 100 countries have signed that treaty, and some human rights groups oppose cluster bombs altogether because of concerns that duds could explode even years after battle that could hurt or even kill innocent people. So now you've got the White House making this big reversal with President Biden signing a waiver. He had to bypass the law in this country to do this, to make the transfer of the weapons, according to what two U.S. officials are telling our team. This may become politically problematic for him inside his own party. Here's what the White House has to say. We will not leave Ukraine defenseless at any point in this conflict, period. Let's bring in NBC's Courtney Kubi, who is all over this story for us. It is a big deal. It is a big reversal, it seems, for the Biden administration. You heard the president get asked why now. He says, because they're running out of ammo. Is that the case? Yes, and specifically, it's artillery that they're concerned about. So Ukraine has been expending tens of thousands of rounds every single week, and it's really stepped up during this counteroffensive that's about a month old now. The concern is the U.S. and allies have had a hard time resupplying their artillery rounds for several months now. Well, the, the, the reason that this cluster munition decision went from a no to a yes was because they're, they're hoping that this can be used as what the Pentagon is calling a bridge. So provide these munitions so that they have some sort of an ammunition—they have an ammunition for this counteroffensive while they continue to build up more and more, of specifically the 155 millimeter artillery shells so they can keep providing those to Ukraine. There are two pieces of controversy and potential pushback on this court. Let me start first with the international landscape. We heard Jake Sullivan, who you just saw, come out and say that Ukraine has provided written assurances because of, you know, the concern of how dangerous these weapons are. More than 100 countries have banned them. Um, there is a geopolitical implication here. Is there any expectation of pushback internationally from allies court on this? There has been a little bit of pushback, and I think the expectation is that Vilnius next week, this will be a topic of discussion, at least behind the scenes. But the officials who I'm speaking with here said, look, a lot of the allies aren't happy about it, but they understand this decision. And there's such a push to make sure that Ukraine is able to stay in this fight right now, in this counteroffensive, that some allies seem resigned to the fact that they ha that the U.S. Is, is doing what they believe they need to do to help Ukraine. But it's this is still not without its controversy. Now, you mentioned those written assurances that Ukraine gave. gave. One of those was that they would not, uh, they would not uh, expend or use these rounds in, in areas where there's a lot of civilians, uh, high population areas, urban areas. Another was that they would record where they explode them, the idea being that if there are duds or unexploded ordnance, that they would know roughly where they are. The third is that they would commit to, to a, an extensive demining effort. So one of the reasons these are controversial is because these duds, some of those little bomblets that we saw in that graphic there, if they don't explode, they have the potential to be potentially deadly to civilians months and years later if they're just sitting there in the ground and someone comes upon them after the war is over. So if the, the Ukrainians have committed to, to demining or going through the areas where they expend these, these munitions, these bombs, with the hope that they'll be able to protect, protect civilians in the future, Hallie. There is also a pushback domestically, Courtney, that we're learning about late tonight with our team on Capitol Hill reporting that some members of the president's own party, some progressives, are concerned about this decision from him. As we mentioned, he had to sign a waiver to get this done. He had to bypass law. Yeah, and it's the, it's the waiver that has them upset. They right. Two, specifically Sarah Jacobs and Elon Omar, two um, Democratic members of Congress, have in, are introducing a legislation to go into the National Defense Authorization Act that would ban the transfer of any cluster munitions, no matter the dud rate, going forward.
Can you plain English it for us, bottom line it for us here, Court? Because ultimately, the reason why the U.S. is giving Ukraine these weapons is to try to make a difference in the war. Is this going to make a difference? Could this tip the scales? No, it won't tip the scales, but it may keep Ukraine in the fight right now. I mean, I, the, the U.S. and allies don't want to talk about just how concerned they are about this artillery shortfall, and this will address that, at least for now, Hallie. Courtney QB, live for us at the Pentagon Court. Thank you very much for all of your reporting on this topic. Thanks. Appreciate it. We are getting some big news on the economic front tonight with this new jobs report out that is giving us some clues about where the economy is, but it's spooking the markets at least a little bit. They're concerned that interest rate hikes could happen again soon. Check it out. You have markets closing in the red late today with these new numbers out from the government showing that the labor market is cooling off a little bit but is still strong. Brian Chung's at the big board to help us make sense of this. Because honestly, Brian, it can be confusing. The labor market is cooling. That's bad. But it's still strong. That's good. But the Fed wants to see the labor market cool. So it's good that it's cooling? Like, how are we supposed to think about it? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's cooling, but it's still hot, right? I think that's the big takeaway here. And economists that I have spoken to and heard from have said this is kind of a Goldilocks report. Not too big, not too small, right? So let's take a look at the numbers. 209,000, that's how many jobs were added in the month of June. That's a slower pace than the 306,000 that we saw in May, but might be more consistent with levels and a pace that economists say is where the economy should be to make sure that inflationary pressures don't get out of control. I'll walk into that in a few seconds. But where do we see the job gains in the month? We saw them in leisure and hospitality, so think bars and restaurants adding 20 21,000 jobs. Professional and business services, white collar jobs also getting a boost as well, up 21,000. But not all industries did grow in the month. We saw retail trade, think of jobs at the mall, actually contract by about 11,000 in the month. Now, how does this relate back to inflation as I kind of teased? It comes from this picture right here, average hourly earnings growth. How much more do people get paid in June of this year compared to June of last year? And it went up by 4.4%. That, however, is a faster pace than the 4.3% we had seen in the month of May, the Federal Reserve is looking at this, saying, whoa, maybe employers are going to pass on this higher cost to consumers. If that's the case, do we need to further try to slow this economy through another interest rate hike? And that's why markets are pricing in, as of this afternoon, the likelihood that the Fed will raise interest rates again in their next meeting at the end of the month, Hallie. There's also a part of this that's really interesting, and it's what these new numbers are telling us about the so-called great resignation that we saw after the pandemic. It's part of a story that, you know, I'm working on for Nightly News tonight, and our team spoke with one company out in Pella, Iowa, that makes windows. They couldn't, they were having trouble, right, keeping people working for them. A lot of people just all over the country would quit their jobs, go to new jobs. Well, this company, Pella, spent tons of money on housing and childcare and restaurants to try to retain employees. It seems to be working. Their retention rate is up 36%. Listen. We have the team members that we need uh, at this point moving forward um, com as compared to the high demand and needs during the pandemic. How should we be thinking about whether workers are still quitting or whether they've quit quitting? Yeah, Hallie, there was a point in time where there were about two job openings for every unemployed person, and that meant that there was a lot of options for people to leave their current jobs and move elsewhere, hence the big perks and the big benefits that companies like the one that you talked to were offering their employees to make sure that they didn't run across the street. Now, that picture is changing. Recent data from the government shows that the amount of vacancies per unemployed person went down to about 1.6. Again, that's a 20% drop from the two figure that we had seen at parts of last year. So fewer options means that perhaps that picture is changing. The dynamics might be in more in favor of the employer. We'll have to see if that trend continues in the months to come, Allie. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Enjoy your Friday. So listen, here in Washington, you've got Republicans in Congress tonight who want answers. They are, in fact, flexing their muscle to demand answers from the Secret Service after that little baggie of cocaine was found in the West Wing on Sunday. You have one top Republican, James Comer, saying he wants a briefing on this ASAP for his committee on the who, the why, the how this bag of drugs got into one of the most secure buildings in the world. In a letter to the agency's director, Comer calls the discovery, in his words, an alarming development and says his committee now has to assess White House security practices Republican Tom Cotton over on the Senate side has made a similar request, saying he wants those blanks filled in by next week. And then there's presidential candidate and Senator Tim Scott. Listen. What if it was anthrax? Mm -hmm. The security risk associated with not being able to find where the cocaine comes from is a problem. Think about the judgment that we're seeing out of the White House. 
So what happens next in the Secret Service investigation? We will probably get an update on or by Monday as far as where that investigation stands. Remember, they're looking into this. They're doing, you know, taking samples. They're dusting the bag, the whole nine yards. But they may never figure out who actually brought this cocaine into the building. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell, for days now, Kelly, has been following this story for us, which is so strange, right? It's such a bizarre story. And there is a security implication here. Senator Scott brought it up. But when he says something like, what if it was anthrax? I think that's what a lot of people think white powder and a little baggy that's the concern it's not apples to apples it's not because certain kinds of chemical compounds that can be weaponized and used in a harmful way either against the president or people on the grounds uh, there are detection methods for that that can be both mechanical or with the help of four-legged friends dogs uh, that are trained for those specific compounds and that is part of the screening that happens here in addition to uh, metal detectors and things to do to determine if there are weapons and that kind of thing but when it's in the realm of a power Powdery substance or something else that could be used uh, to make an explosive, all of those things. There are different kinds of uh, equipment and dogs that are trained for those things. They are not narcotics dogs. That's your local police department that does that. So that may be part of what's happening here. Uh, the investigation is ongoing. They've been doing things like looking for fingerprints, DNA, uh, reviewing video, reviewing visitor logs. And the challenge is this is a very small plastic bag. It is a, a limited sample from which to try to get forensic evidence. And so far, we don't have any indication from our sources that anything has been found thus far. So there's an expectation that there may be some more work that can be done Monday. So this goes into next week. If that evidence is found, if it's, if it's something that is actionable, then there'll be some new steps for how they would proceed. Uh, but at this point, we're still waiting. Uh, but they've been setting the expectations uh, pretty low about being able to find the culprit uh, in this cocaine uh, event. In what is perhaps the most talked about packet of cocaine like on the planet, Ever. Kelly, is, is yeah. uh, seriously, Ever. is the ex in, in real life, at least, much less Hollywood movies, is there an expectation the Secret Service will go and try to give some of these answers to Republicans? They will certainly be, from what I've been told, responsive to the letters that have been sent to them, which do put uh, specific questions, some of which are things that can be answered. And then um, I think there is a, a part of the expectations issue here. We know there are po political dynamics to this. There are legitimate questions about oversight of security. And then you have sort of the environment we're in, where a, a crime TV drama would resolve this before the hour was up. Uh, it may not happen in real life in this case. So I think they want to keep expectations at a point where yeah. it may uh, it may not be solved. If they do get that actionable information, then we'll have uh, we'll have more stories to tell you about that. And uh, certainly there are visitors, uh, employees, uh, there are workers who are part of construction project that's happening here right. who are on campus. Uh, so there are a lot of people who come through some of these places. The, the entrance where this occurred on West Executive that you know well uh, is a really busy work uh, location. Yeah. Not a ceremonial entrance, but where people who are working here come in and out. And uh, that includes some private tours when people bring their guests, family, friends, that's Aunt true. Edna from Missouri who's in town, that kind of thing. God bless Aunt Edna. Kelly O'Donnell, yes. thank you very much. I'm sure we'll talk again on Monday. Appreciate it. Speaking of politics, let's take you out to Iowa, where former President Donald Trump is headlining his biggest campaign rally there in months and really trying to galvanize his supporters around the web of legal problems that he's facing. Look. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. Because in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. Remember the timing here, just 24 hours after his co-defendant, essentially, in that classified documents case in Florida, Walt Nada, his body man, was arraigned in Miami. You're looking at those court sketches there. People in Iowa showed up to see the former president for hours. They were waiting in the rain, umbrellas out, not great weather, but that didn't stop him. You also saw the former president really try to go after his top Republican rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. As NBC News is exclusively reporting about some new issues Mr. DeSantis may have in that all-important state, our team reporting that he touted sending workers to that deadly building collapse in Iowa last month, 10 hours after Iowa told him they no longer needed Florida's offer to help. Vaughn Hilliard is on the ground in Iowa and joins us now. You're there, you've been at the rally, you've talked to people there. Um, it is, listen, 
we're going to have 100 million trillion rallies between now and Election Day, right? Like, that's not the newsworthy piece of it. What is interesting about this one is the way that the former president, on the heels of this arraignment for one of his close aides, is continuing to lean into this idea that he is being politically persecuted with the charges against him. Right. And this, for Donald Trump, he told this crowd here, they're looking to take away my freedom because they want to take away your freedom next. Donald Trump is laying this out very clearly to them. That this is not his legal battle. This is their legal battle. He says if he does not win the White House next year and go into the White House, the country is gone. He called it the biggest battle of voters' lifetime. I mean, those are the stakes that he is putting at this. He is telling these voters that Donald Trump is a cold stone thief. Again, Donald Trump's words here today to this Iowa crowd. And he is making the legal implications political for him. And right now, it's raising him uh, millions of dollars. And right now in the polls, it's giving him pretty sturdy ground. Take a listen to one of the folks we talked to, because there were thousands that stood out here today in cold rain before entering inside. Take a listen. This morning, we came out about 3 a.m. We just kind of threw the night, came back and forth. Oh, yeah, it's worth the rain. It's worth the rain. As uh, our producer colleague Dan Gallo asked one woman who was standing out in the rain, said, what would it take for you to leave? And Hallie, her response was a million dollars. Donald Trump is worth it. Um, we, there's also been, and I think leading up to this rally, there was a lot of discussion, I think, from those in Donald Trump's orbit. He would draw contrast, which is like the political PR right. way of saying, go on attack. There has been a lot of contrast drawn between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis, as we have this new exclusive reporting here at NBC News about this sort of moment between Florida and Iowa. Talk us through it. Right. This reporting, it stems back to one month ago and the tragic collapse of that uh, apartment complex in Davenport, Iowa, that left three dead. And on July, I should say on June 4th, the governor of Iowa had requested the assistance of uh, Florida emergency personnel. And uh, Ron DeSantis granted it, but he even posted the following day that he was sending emergency personnel to come with the assistance. But uh, our colleague Matt Dixon has new reporting that 10 hours before uh, Ron DeSantis tweeted that, that the state of Iowa had told Florida, actually, never mind, we don't need your crews. And you know, I can tell you one uh, Trump staffer has already put on his social media account calling Ron DeSantis a liar. And this is part of you know the Trump campaign really uh, looking at the minutia uh, that is Ron DeSantis yeah. and trying to call into question the Republican electorate, the legitimacy of him and whether they want to put trust in him. And I should say, for the first time to my own ears here today, Hallie, I heard a crew, this, uh, I, heard, I, heard a, I heard a crowd decisively boo Ron DeSantis at the mention hmm. uh, of uh, his name by Donald Trump, which is a notable difference in the, usually the muted silence we've had over the last months when Donald Trump meant, directly mentions him. Vaughn Hill, you're live for us on the campaign trail tonight in Iowa. Vaughn, thank you. To Texas now, where the shooter in one of the worst mass shootings in American history is today been given 90 back-to-back -back life sentences. That's for the attack at a Walmart in El Paso that left 23 people dead in 2019. This is after two days of just gut-wrenching statements from dozens of victims' family members, people who loved, the people who died, talking about their anger and their pain and the damage, the devastation that this suspect brought. Listen to what one man who lost his mom in the shooting had to say about the sentence. You know, to be honest with you, I'm not going to really go there right now with how I really feel. I just don't think that 90 consecutive life sentences is enough right now. Not enough right now, he says. The shooter pleaded guilty to 90 federal charges, including 45 hate crimes. Remember, he admitted targeting Hispanic shoppers at that store. I want to go to Guadvanegas, who's been covering this. It has been so emotional for so many people, with so much of a focus on accountability here. Guad. Hallie, that is correct. And we should also say that the, these victim impact statements that we heard uh, during this hearing the last two days also shared details of what these people had to go through the last four years. It's not just that anger and frustration, but also what their life has been like. Some of those that spoke were inside the store when the shooting happened and talked about their fear going into public spaces and what it's been like for them with the trauma of living with this experience. And of course, the accountability. Uh, we know 
that uh, the shooter agreed to this plea deal for the 90 charges. And uh, today, his defense attorney spoke on his behalf. Uh, the shooter did not want to speak in court. Uh, his attorney saying that he understands what he did and he accepts that the sentence from the judge, the 90 life sentences, consecutive life sentences. And he also added that he was there in case any family member or someone who was close to someone that died would want to speak with him. Uh, this is the shooter. Uh, his attorney also said uh, that, that, that he had several issues with his uh, mental health, and he asked for mental health uh, treatment while in jail. Uh, these are all messages, uh, of course, shared uh, by the attorney again. And when it comes to the victims that spoke, because, of course, uh, they lost loved ones, but they are also victims, we've also heard some of them frustrated because they say it took too long for this trial to end and for the sentence to be handed down. Here's a family member. This is a man that lost his aunt, uh, his aunt, and here's him speaking on camera about that frustration with things taking so long. You know, it was a, a total debacle, and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's sad. Um, and I feel like we're being manipulated by this whole situation. We should not have had to wait four years for this guy to get go to jail or get the death penalty. And, of course, we still have uh, the case in state court, uh, which is still set to begin for that district attorney's office uh, is asking for a death uh, penalty. That is still set to begin. So there will be more emotions for a lot of these victims and those that lost loved ones. Hallie. Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you so much for staying on top of this story. Coming up here on the show, some new warnings tonight about a rise in the number of malaria cases for the first time in, like, two decades. Where and why infections might be spreading. Plus, why New Jersey firefighters say they need a new way to train first responders. That's coming up in The Five Things. The longest married first couple is celebrating another milestone today. That's coming up in our five things. But first, let's talk about something just into NBC News. Some new video obtained by TMZ showing this controversial moment now captured on camera between Britney Spears and a security guard for the NBA's top rookie. It's a slap. Look at it here. This is Britney Spears in the green. She taps. Boom. We're going to show it again. She goes up. She taps Victor Weminiana on kind of the back, whatever, mid, mid back. The security guard, without turning around, backhands her, slaps her right there. Um, and, and that's what happened here. Britney Spears was talking about it. She went and just last night, we, we told you about this story, she posted online about what happened, saying in an Instagram post um, that she was, in her words, backhanded by the security guard. She says she had tapped Wemby on the shoulder to congratulate him on his success. Wemby had said it wasn't a tap, that he was grabbed from behind. Obviously, that's not what appears to be shown on this video. This is a whole thing now, just as the Wemby era unofficially begins tonight. Remember, he was the NBA's number one overall draft pick. Tonight, making his summer league debut for the Spurs. Dana Griffin is joining us now, and this is like another layer to this moment, getting so much attention between Britney Spears, this basketball superstar, and his bodyguard, yeah. basically. Yeah, Hallie, and it's so telling because there's a lot of inconsistencies from both sides. Britney Spears saying that she was backhanded, and police say they saw surveillance video, so maybe they had a different angle, but they say the security guard removed her hand from Wimby's back, and that may have been what caused her to actually hit herself in her face. Uh, but then also you had Wimby who said he felt someone grab him, not just tap him, but it looks like it's just a single hand on him. So, and maybe it was the security guard's motion that made him feel like there was more happening there. Uh, but, you know, the police department, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department says they are not filing charges in this case against the security guard because after not only speaking with the security guard, but even a member of Brittany Spears' own security team, they learned that removing a fan or someone, their, their hand from a person when they're actively guarding them is something that is actually quite, you know, something that they often do. It's actually mm. part of protocol to do that. So he may have, you know, done it a little too forceful for a lot of people who are watching this video, but it wasn't like he turned around, backhanded her, and I think that's probably why, um, in this particular case, they are not filing charges. The police department also said that both parties, Brittany and the security guard, apologized to one another for the misunderstanding, and it oh. was understood that night that both teams were, that this, that this incident had ended and that both teams were settled, but apparently that's not the case. We are still waiting to hear back from Brittany Spears. We've reached out to her team after this new video was released, and the police department's uh, decision not to file charges, Hallie.
Dana Griffin, live for us there out west. Dana, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, that huge cargo ship fire that killed two New Jersey firefighters could keep burning now for days. Look at this. This fire started Wednesday on a big ship that was carrying thousands of cars. Fire officials say the department had been trained on how to respond on passenger ships, but not on certain kinds of cargo ships. Right now, they're trying to focus on making sure the ship stays cool and making sure that it doesn't actually sink. Number two, kidney stones are typically seen in older men, but more and more kids are getting them, and doctors aren't really sure why. You know, a kidney stone, they're this, it's like really painful to urinate out. They're like mineral deposits, basically. It turns out cases are up something like 26% in older teens over the last couple decades. Dehydration could be a factor. Number two, we're seeing now two more malaria cases in Florida, bringing the total number to six. That's not a huge number, but it is still significant. Health officials say that's because these cases were caught locally. They're not from people who traveled and came back. They were picked up in Florida. First time that's happened in decades. It comes as two of Florida's top health officials have left their positions. They have not yet been replaced by the governor. Number four, a new study finds that board games based on numbers help make young kids better at math. Little kids playing Monopoly, shoots and ladders, um, anything where you're counting or adding or subtracting, that is like really good for little brains. They found that physical games do it better than digital ones, so maybe dust off your old box of games in the cabinet in your dining room. Number, number five, former President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind are celebrating their 77th wedding anniversary today, extending their record as the longest married first couple ever. They had a quiet day at home to celebrate. Remember, Jimmy Carter is 98 years old. He's been in home hospice care since February. So listen, this weekend, somebody, maybe you, could win more than a billion dollars if you're really lucky, if you actually win both the Powerball and the Mega Millions. If you do that, just quit. You know what I mean? Like, just go bet on every horse that ever, like, do it. Like, if, you, if you're lucky enough to win both of those things and get a billion dollars, like, my man, God bless. Saturday's Powerball is, like, $615 million. Mega Millions is now $450 million. So if you're like, okay, well, Hallie, what are my odds? Like, could I, could I do it? One in 290 million. Maura Barrett joins us now. Are you feeling lucky, Maura? First of all, I'm thrilled you're back. It is so lovely to see you. We, we have missed you. Um, how busy is that lotto counter behind you? Um, is it lotto fever yet? Like, sometimes we talk about this. This comes up. People get super excited. What's the vibe? Yeah, Holly, I missed you guys, too, and I'm thrilled to be back. And we were joking before, maybe I'll get that lucky ticket and then you won't see me again. But people <laughs> have been streaming in the door here. There's a big sign out front advertising that Mega Millions. You see it at the cash register here. But those odds are extremely low, Hallie. To put it into perspective, you are more likely, 250 times more likely, to be struck by lightning than to win this jackpot. But it might be worth trying. How many, um, how many people have shown up to buy the tickets tonight where you are? I've been here for about half an hour and dozens of people have been streaming in. Our team over at the airport this morning saw something similar, but this is something that everyone is really looking forward to, hoping to get lucky. But I want to put it into perspective in terms of how much money you might get if you do win, because this is just the pre-tax number when you're talking about that 450 mil, 615 million dollars. What is going to happen if you do win is federal taxes will take out about 24 percent of that total number. And then depending on what state you play in, state taxes could come into play as well. And then if you win, you have to decide between taking it all in one lump sum or getting those incremental payouts year over year. Now, I'm not a financial advisor, but I'm told that second option is the better one to take. But experts do recommend hiring a financial advisor when you come into a lot of money like this because this really is a massive number. I want to show you really quickly uh, the, the numbers that we've seen over the last few years breaking some of those records, the top five. It doesn't compare to that $2 billion from last Last year, Hallie, right. uh, but it is 600 million really isn't anything to scoff at, at least I don't think so. And the reason the number is so high right now is because there hasn't been a winner since April. Now, again, we mentioned those low odds. You really got to get lucky. Uh, but I will say here in Illinois, they did win that one point eight billion dollar Mega Millions last year. So I've got my two dollar tickets hoping to repeat history with that Illinois luck. If you send me a Venmo, I could transfer some of that Illinois luck to you as well. <laughs> if you want, Hallie. I don't know. I'm going to try my hand at like D.C., Maryland, Virginia luck. Maura Barrett. I, nobody's scoffing at 600 million. <laughs> I'd take the lump sum. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you soon.
Still to come here on the show, one of our NBC Sports reporters is going from covering the Olympics to trying to compete in them in a sport he's never actually done competitively before. What in the hell is Corey Robinson thinking? I mean, we're going to talk about it in the backstory. Plus, why a whole country's government just collapsed. Coming up. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, the focus is on the Olympics, specifically how you can go from reporting on the Olympics to competing in them with the spotlight on Corey Robinson. You know Corey if you watch this show. He's been on with us a bunch. He's an NBC News sports reporter, an NBC sports reporter, I should say. This is him. This is at the Tokyo Olympics. Corey covered that a couple years ago. But for the 2028 LA Games, he's hoping to be there in a very different way as a rower for Team USA. Now, here's the thing about Corey. Corey has never actually rowed competitively before. <laughs> he has started from scratch. And it, oh, oh, there's a lot, it looks like it. Oh, oh, well, future Olympian, maybe? He is determined. He's got the desire, and his coach says he has the potential. I'm a little hopeful, you know? The pinpoint balance is crazy. It's like being on a nice edge. Yes. That's the hardest part. Well, first of all, welcome to Rowan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, coach. Yeah. No, it was great. I think uh, you, got, you got some potential, so. How much potential do you think I can make it to LA 28? Yes, absolutely. Really? Yeah. I'm thrilled to have you for this segment, Corey. As you know, it's like pulling back the curtain. Give us the story behind the story. Because yeah. you've been on the show a million times. We've talked about, like, the big sports stories you've been on as a correspondent, et cetera. Um, are you doing this as, like, an assignment? Are you doing this because it's a personal <laughs> dream of yours? Like, what's up? No, no, this is a, this is a dream of mine, Ali. Um, since I was a little kid, you know, my dad was on the dream team, right? So I grew up looking at the 1992 Olympic gold medal, you know? And like, in my ho house, my Explain dad's NBA who your dad is, by the way, oh, for people who don't know. Uh, he, he played for the San Antonio Spurs. His name is David Robinson. So, like, he's an NBA champion. He's an NBA Hall of Famer. But it's always been the Olympics. That's always been the pinnacle in my household. You know, that's in, like, the biggest sporting event in the world. And then I told my dad I want to be an Olympian. I want to be like you. I want to go to the Naval Academy. But then Notre Dame said, you want to play football for us? I said, oh, I can't turn that down. And then the Olympic dream shifted and pivoted. Cause became I became a reporter. So I was at, like, in Tokyo. I was in Beijing covering curling. And then there was this moment, Hallie, where I texted and my dad coming back from Beijing. I was on the bus and I said, wait a second, how old were you when you went to Barcelona? We were the same age. So it's just an answered prayer in a wow. weird way. And I was like, wow, I, I went to two Olympics just like my dad at the same age, but this time I wanted to compete. So that's why I shifted over. I think it's incredible. Like, I love this so much for you. And, I, and I'm also thinking about maybe the people that have been competing and rowing competitively since they've been in, you know, middle school, high school, college, who are looking at you going, the audacity of this guy, right? Like, to come in and think he can do it in five years. Is it seriously realistic? You have this five-year plan to do it in that amount of time to try to get to the Olympics? Rowing is very hard. And this is, this is one of the things I really want to emphasize on this journey. It is not easy. <laughs> you, saw, you saw me. You saw me. So, like, I have a long way to go. So, for me, I, I, it's been really fascinating kind of learning from the community. Megan O'Leary did it. She um, played softball and volleyball at UVA. And then she picked it up in her mid-20s and then made two Olympic games. It's not impossible. And Megan's been so unbelievably generous with her time. Awesome. And other Olympians that I've met have been the same way. They've been like, oh, wow, you're getting into rowing. That's so cool for the sport, for the culture. And they're trying to teach me the way, um, you know, and how to do it. But, yeah, it's very hard, Allie. <laughs> like, Why did I, I, it's very hard. I... I I wouldn't know, and I'll never know, because I, I don't want to know. Um, why <laughs> rowing? Like, why not a sport that you'd actually done before? Well, because, so, it's basically my only option. It's, so, I got, uh, like, years okay. and years ago, I was, uh, I was in New York, and these Olympians were like, wow, like, you have the perfect body for rowing. And I was like, well, I didn't know that. It was in the back of my mind <laughs> for about six or seven years. And then I, it's L.A., I'll be 33 when I compete in L.A., and that's, like, the peak, uh, you know, as far as uh, rowing is concerned. So, I said, hey, this is my only chance to do it, might as well try.
Um, where do you find the time? Because my lord, like you're you're doing your job, you're reporting, and I will tell you, like that is a job as I that takes up a lot yeah. of time. What are you just up super early, up super late? Yeah, exactly. So after the Today Show this morning, I went home and I got a 45 minute bike in. <laughs> I was working, and then I came over here to do the show with you. So yeah, now I, I got to go back and, and work tonight, and then this weekend I'll oh be on the water. God. So it's, um, you know, it's just a lifestyle. I, I mean, I'm so thrilled for you. Did your dad have any words of wisdom? Did he give you any advice after like having his medal and his whole thing? Uh, I mean, I just called him and said, hey, Dad, I'm trying to do this, and, I, and he's trying to support me. So I, as far as words of advice, work hard <laughs> and be appreciative. Like you said, it's, it's a very hard journey, so I'm just very, very thankful that you even try. Can I just say, I want to say it now, like clip it and save it. I hope that in 2028, Corey, we're doing like one of those really dramatic profiles of you competing. <laughs> and like this interview is part of it, right? Of like so the too. early days of Corey Robinson's journey. And then you're there like going for the gold. So I hope so. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. Seriously. You have, our whole team is rooting for you. Go, Corey. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, friend. We'll see you. Coming up, we've told you why tens of thousands of people are going to one town in Spain. Now, officials say some of those folks have been hurt. We will explain. So at a news conference, you typically get the news. But in this instance, we're about to show you the news conference itself is the news. If that sounds kind of confusing, let me just show you and you'll see what I mean. Watch. In the future, are you intending to conduct a rebellion or to rebel against your boss, your creator? I'm not sure why you would think that. My creator has been nothing but kind to me, and I am very happy with my current situation. So that is a reporter asking if the robot will rebel. The robot, in a real shocker of a twist, says, who, me? Rebel against, against you? This was at a United Nations summit, a UN summit on AI in Geneva. And those nine robots you just saw were answering some questions people have been wondering, like, are they going to take over our jobs? I will be working alongside humans to provide assistance and support and will not be replacing any existing jobs. For more on this, let's bring in Aaron Gilchrist. Well, that's what they say now, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, listen, first of all, it, it was bold to assign this story to a diehard Trekkie. Like, I am all about this. Oh, no. it, it makes total sense to me. The, the whole Got robot it. AI thing makes a lot of sense. But so in this case, you know, it, it was weird to have this news conference where you have these robots, nine robots sitting on a stage answering questions from reporters. Like actual journalists. They're actual the room. reporters yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, talking to the robots and their creators about the future of artificial intelligence and humanoid uh, robots is what they call them, humanoid robots. And so there was actually one reporter who asked Sophia, one of the robots there, about uh, for her thoughts about robots becoming more effective leaders or taking over even. Listen to this. I believe that humanoid robots have the potential to lead with a greater level of efficiency and effectiveness than human leaders. We don't have the same biases or emotions that can sometimes cloud decision making. Oh, this so is some you, Spock stuff, right? Though, isn't you, it? Did, <laughs> it gets a little weird. I know, I know. So you saw the little guy, not the little guy, but the guy sitting next to the robot. That was her creator. His name yeah. is uh, David Hansen. We talked to him today about his robot and some of this technology. You see him there. And I asked him about people's fears that robots will take over and they'll become dangerous in some way. And his response was basically that as these developers are working to make these robots more human, it will also make them safer to have around. Mm. Listen to this an artificial general intelligence that is an alien that we're forcing to work as a mere tool and trying to hyper control, we're going to fear it. It's not going to necessarily understand or care about mm -hmm. us. And then things can get really chaotic if it becomes generally intelligent. So this is where he and I started talking about okay. Star Trek. And Star okay. Trek The Next Generation, there was an android, Data, who uh, the entire series is just trying to become more human. And so the logic here is that if we teach these robots through AI to be more empathetic, more sympathetic, more sensitive, that they would then be able to work with us better in all the different problems in the world that we, as humans, aren't able to solve quickly. And you see there's data there, my, my good friend from I, my childhood. So I'm so annoyed we only have 15 seconds yeah. left because I, I just could talk about this with you for forever. Why did they hold this news conference in the first place? I have to imagine it was to shine a spotlight that you went on this. 100%. They wanted to start a dialogue around what it's going to take to make sure that AI develops in a way that is ethical. Uh, 
in a way that's going to be useful for us in, in, in the future. Um, it, they really just wanted to start the dialogue globally about this, and it did. Uh, our chief Star Trek correspondent, Aaron Gilchrist, thank you. I uh, really appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of the Netherlands, the government, uh, it has just collapsed tonight after talks fell through on a deal to restrict immigration. The country's prime minister has now resigned. He was the longest serving prime minister in that country ever, but he says he's going to stay on as kind of a caretaker until new elections in the fall. Out of Spain, some people got hurt at the running of the bulls in Pamplona today. Some folks fell down. Fortunately, nobody was gored. Today was just the first of eight days of bull runs. And out of Brazil, deforestation is down in the Amazon, according to some new government data. It dropped, apparently, by something like 33% in the first six months of the current president's term. It's the lowest it's been in four years. This president has pledged to crack down on illegal log logging and to end net deforestation in the Amazon by 2030. Still to come here on the show, Taylor Swift is not just changing a lyric in her re-recorded album. She is trying to change the whole industry. We'll explain how next. Swift herself is setting a new model for the rest of the industry. That's after she released Speak Now, Taylor's version. You've probably heard it or heard of it. It's the third of six albums she's re-recording because before this, she didn't own any of it. Back in 2019, remember, the masters to her first albums were sold to this big producer, Scooter Braun. It meant that Swift wasn't making the kind of money she should have from them, and she had no control over it. This is something we hear again and again from artists, especially when they sign deals with record companies towards the beginning of their careers. Look at TLC. My generation, back when they were on top of the charts, they were winning Grammys. They said they were as broke as broke could be because they didn't fully own the rights to their own music. So Swift is trying to change the game. And so far for her, it's been working. Look at the numbers here. On the left side, you see Fearless. Taylor's version had one and a half billion streams compared to the original, like a, about a third of it. Red, even more dramatic with the numbers, three billion streams for Taylor's version compared to about half a million for the original. Let's get to Emily Aketa for more on this. Okay, so Emily, these re-releases, anybody who has a TikTok page or an Instagram page knows that, like, it's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. Fans, Taylor Swift, it's a big deal for. Talk about how this album has been doing and what kind of an impact these albums have had on the others. Well, Holly, let me first start off by saying happy July 7th to you and anyone who celebrates the most uh, highly anticipated album, my per personal favorite album, Speak Now. As you mentioned, for anyone who has spent just about any amount of time on social media today, you are probably probably aware whether you are a Swifty or you are not, that she dropped 22 songs, including some From the Vault songs overnight, and it's causing quite a buzz. A lot of sparks are flying. For the most part, we're seeing a lot of excitement on social media, some happy tears, of course, but there's also some chatter around like, hey, I noticed her voice has kind of shifted. I mean, this album first was released back in 2010. Some people suggesting that she's not putting as much emotion into it. The other thing causing a lot of chatter is a lyric change in the song Better Than Revenge. She no longer sings, quote, she's better known for the things that she does on the mattress, which has faced some criticism over the years. And now the lyric is, quote, he was a moth to the flame. She was holding the matches. So I went to Cornelia Street today, which, of course, is the inspiration for one of her songs on the Lover album. And I talked to Swifties about their excitement. Take a listen here. I grew up to Taylor Swift songs, and so it's just so fun, or it's so cool to see how her music has matured throughout the years, and that I've matured with it, so now it's cool to listen back to those old songs from when I was younger. And Swift's mission to re-record some of her earlier albums has been nothing short of legendary. I want to share some analysis from Billboard with you. You take a look at the numbers. Total sales over the same time period. These are her other re-recorded albums. Fearless, Taylor's version, 737,000 copies, while the original uh, was selling 41,000. A similar difference between Red, Taylor's version, and Red, uh, the former version. Swift still has three more albums, Hallie, to re-record so she can reclaim the rights. What is so interesting to me, and I will be honest, I'm like 
Swift agnostic. I'm not like a super fan. I'm not an anti fan. I'm cool, like whatever. Totally cool We're with gonna it. We're going to lure but you what, over. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm willing to be lured. I think there is a business angle that is fascinating here, right? And we talked about it just a second ago. The idea that this could set the model maybe for other artists in an industry that hasn't always done a great job at making sure those artists are compensated early in their careers. So talk me through that piece of it, the way that this could actually be somewhat revolutionary. Yeah, definitely. I think this is certainly a conversation starter for a lot of artists who don't own their masters. And not even Taylor Swift has expected this level of success with the Taylor's version albums. Her wild popularity has generated so much excitement that people are even aware of this. So they're, they're going to buy Taylor's version or they're going to stream Taylor's version. So an artist would really have to generate, I would presume, the same kind of energy in order to share that same kind of success. Taylor's version of Fearless, for instance, was the first re-recorded album in history to top the Billboard 200, Hallie. Emily Akata, good to see you. I'm glad you had fun on Cornelia Street. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Hallie. That does it for us for this hour. We'll see you right back here on Monday. Top Story picks up our coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.